William S. Gilbert. Gilbert was one half of the uh, theatrical team of Gilbert and Sullivan. And uh, as an additional outlet for uh, his artistic efforts, he, uh, for about 10 years, would publish uh, narrative uh, verse in, uh, under a heading called Babs Ballad. One of these poems was called Etiquette, and I'm going to do that for you here in just a second. But as is my habit, I will be explaining a few words from the poem. Um, Gilbert makes passing rest, uh, reference to an Alexander Selkirk. Now, if you lived in the 19th century, you probably would have known Selkirk. During the first decade of the 1700s, uh, Selkirk was marooned on an island off the coast of Chile for uh, over four years. And the history of his survival served uh, as an inspiration both for human resourcefulness and for Daniel Defoe's uh, novel, Robinson Crusoe, uh, the, the story. And, of his life is, is much more interesting than fiction. And we are going to do etiquette. <clears throat> the Bally Shannon foundered off the coast of Caribou, and down in fathoms many went the captain and the crew. Down went the owners, greedy men, whom hope of gain allured. Oh, dry the starting tear, for they were heavily insured. Beside the captain and the mate, the owners and the crew, the passengers were also drowned, excepting only two. Young Peter Gray, who tasted teas for Baker, Croup, and Co., and Summers, who from eastern shores imported indigo. These passengers, by reason of their clinging to a mast upon a desert island, were eventually cast. They hunted for their meals, as Alexander Selkirk used, but they couldn't chat together. They had not been introduced. For Peter Gray and Summers, too, though certainly in trade, were properly particular about the friends they made. And somehow, thus they settled it, without a word of mouth, that Gray should take the northern half. Well, Summers took the south. On Peter's portions, Oysters grew a delicacy rare, but oysters were a delicacy Peter couldn't bear. On summer's side was turtle, on the shingle, lying thick, which summers couldn't eat because it always made him sick. Gray gnashed his teeth with envy as he saw a mighty store of turtle unmolested on his fellow creature's shore. The oysters at a feet his side impatiently he shoved for turtle and his mother were the only things he loved. And Summers sighed in sorrow as he settled in the south, for the thought of Peter's oysters brought the water to his mouth. He longed to lay him down upon the shelly bed and stuff. He had often eaten oysters, but had never had enough. How they wished an introduction to each other they had had when on board the Bally Shannon, and it drove them nearly mad to think how very friendly with each other they might get if it wasn't for the arbitrary rule of etiquette. One day, well, out of hunting for the must ridiculous, Gray overheard his fellow man soliloquizing thus, I wonder how the playmates of my youth are getting on. McConnell, S.B. Walters, Patty Bile, and Robinson. These simple words made Peter as delighted as could be. Old chummies at the Charter House were Robinson and he. He walked right up to Summers and he turned extremely red, hesitated, hemmed and hawed a bit, then cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, pray forgive me. If I seem too bold, but you have breathed the name I know familiarly of old. You spoke aloud of Robinson. I happen to be by. You know him? Yes, extremely well. Allow me. So do I. It was enough. They felt they could more pleasantly get on. For, ah, the magic of the fact. They each knew Robinson. And Mr. Summers' turtle was at Peter's service quite, and Mr. Summers punished Peter's oyster beds all night. They soon became like brothers. From community of wrongs, they wrote each other little 
odes and sang each other songs. They told each other anecdotes disparaging their wives. On several occasions, too, they saved each other's lives. They felt quite melancholy when they parted for the night and got up in the morning soon as ever it was light. Each other's pleasant company they reckoned so upon, and all because it happened that they both knew Robinson. They lived for many years on that inhospitable shore, and day by day they learned to like each other more and more. At last, to their astonishment on getting up one day, they saw a frigate anchored in the offing of the bay. To Peter, an idea occurred. Suppose we cross the main, so good an opportunity may not be found again. And Summers thought a minute, then emphatically said, Done! I wonder how my business in the city's getting on. But stay, said Mr. Peter, when in England, as you know, I earned a living tasting teas for Baker, Croup, and Co. I may be superseded. My employer thinks me dead. Then come with me, said Summers, and taste indigo instead. But all their plans were scattered when they found the vessel was a contact ship from Portland outward bound. When a boat came off to fetch them, though they felt it very kind to go on board, they firmly but respectfully declined. And both the happy settlers roared with laughter at the joke. They recognized a gentlemanly fellow pulling stroke. Twas Robinson, a convict in an unbecoming frock, condemned to seven years for misappropriating stock. They laughed no more, for Summers thought he had been rather rash in knowing one whose friend had misappropriated cash. And Peter thought a foolish tack he must have gone upon in making the acquaintance of a friend of Robinson. At first, they didn't quarrel very openly, I've heard. They nodded when they met and now and then exchanged a word. The word grew rare and rarer still, the nodding of the head. And when they meet each other now, they cut each other dead. To allocate the island, they agreed by word of mouth, and Peter takes the north again, and Summers takes the south. And Peter has the oysters, which he hates in layers thick, and Summers has the turtle. Turtle always makes him sick. Etiquette, ladies and gentlemen, by Now, for <clears throat> any of you that feel that tale is too far-fetched, let me uh, uh, relate my one and only uh, visit to the uh, Mobile Country Club. Uh, this was in a, in a previous life when I was a man of meads and not the uh, impecunious itinerant you see before you this evening. Um, but I was invited up to the, uh, the bar overlooking the greens and the club I, with friends, meeting some other friends. I mean, this was like a setting out of Downton Abbey. The room was magnificent. And we were talking and somebody came up and said, so-and-so's downstairs and uh, wants you to come down and say hi. And the people I were with said, well, we're going to go right now. And I says, well, I'll be r along right away. I talked probably longer than I should have, which is my want. And I run downstairs, follow the noise, and I walk into this, this ballroom. And on the stage, uh, it turns out it's a sweet 16 party for one of the daughters of, of this woman. So I don't see my friends and I'm sitting there and I'm watching these young ladies dance. And that was not an unpleasant experience, I'm sorry to say. And uh, uh, out of, a second later, I see out of the corner of my eye a young man with a badge on his shoulder come up or a security patch. And he, he said, uh, sir, uh, may I uh, see you outside? And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, would you please step outside, sir? You could tell he was nervous, but you could also tell he was resolute. So I said, sure. I walked out the, the door with him, and uh, he said, uh, sir, you're, you can't be in there. The hostess doesn't know who you were. And I said, well, I'm just coming down with some friends, da, da, da. He says, I'm sorry, sir, you can't go in the party. I had some comeback, but that was civil. 
civil, curt, but civil. And I, I, uh, I walked back up to my friends upstairs and they were all chatting and they says, where have you been? And I said, I was down there waiting for you. And they, and I said, but I just got kicked out of that party. And, uh, and they all started laughing. They thought that was great sport that I got kicked out. I wasn't so pleased. In fact, there's a poem coming on this that I haven't gotten, gotten around to, to writing yet with, the, with moralization, which I'll save you from now. But the one woman said, she said, well, you know what it was. She said, the hostess didn't know you. And if she didn't know you, you weren't worth knowing. To be continued another day.